Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a special episode of the Me Evolution Podcast. My name is Julian Pennant, MMA pro, and I've got my coach and role model, <laughs> BJJ legend and black belt, Gabriel Rhino. Um, here's my guest. Um, as I said previous, um, there's a lot of people I know um, that I respect a lot and that I know have a lot to tell and a big story to tell for people that is really interesting, where it would be a shame to have the conversation in German with you because in English we just have a better flow. And um, I just introduced you real quick. Um, you might have an introduction of yourself. Just tell the guests who you are, what you're doing and what you're known for. Thank you, Julian. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Gabriel. I'm from Brazil. Uh, been living in Germany for nearly 10 years. I think, yeah. Next end of this year is going to turn 10 years. Wow. I'm still working on my German, though. <laughs> uh, I got promoted to Brown Belt last time to German. In German? In German, yeah. That's what I heard. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I first moved to London. Okay, let's go back first of all. I've uh, been training jiu-jitsu for a long time. I'm turning 39 years old. And I started when I was six. My mom was walking past in the neighborhood where I, where I grew up. She was looking for different, any sports and activity to keep me keep me busy. And then together with my aunt, they found like jiu-jitsu school on, on the top of the house for my first jiu-jitsu coach, Laet Barcelos. She introduced me to the uh, trial class. I still remember. I have bad memories for from the past, but I remember I remember my very first class. He, I was six years old. He brought me to another kid who was training for for a couple of months, and he asked me, "Try take him down." And then I said, "How? So do whatever you think it is correct." So I had this front headlock, throw to the ground, and then he stopped me. Okay. This grip here, you keep there. Now you grab the arm, turn your hips, and throw to the ground. That was a hip throw. That's the first thing I learned ever. I was six years old. And then I was together with my cousins. So we trained together for a long time. Uh, then I also black belts. Every, every, there are three, three brothers. They live in different places. One lives in Minnesota in the West. The other one lives in Qatar. And the, the one is still in Brazil. Uh, so yeah, I did my... Childhood jiu-jitsu career up to juvenile with my first sensei, Laet Barcelos. At the age of 10 years old, I started doing judo because I got a scholarship at private school in Rio. So my parents couldn't afford private school and public school wasn't that good. And so I was able to throw judo to have a scholarship in my uh, like secondary school. And my cousin went to another school, which is the Gamma Filio School. When I was uh, 16 years old, already blue belt, juvenile blue belt, I joined them in, at Gamma Filio, which 10 years later turned into GF team. It's the same, same group, same coach. And then from 18, from 16 years old, 2001, 2002, I joined my current professor, Julius Cesar. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2011, I moved to London. Moved to London first, my first time. I've never been to a plane before. And then I flew all the way from Brazil, from Rio to London. Uh, and then I started teaching Jiu Jitsu there, lived in London for a couple of years, three years. Then moved to Germany, Munich. In Munich, I spent one year, but I was going back and forth, London, Munich. And then since like 10, 10 years ago, been established in Berlin. And that's where obviously I know you from. Um, I remember pretty well when you came to Berlin because back in the days I was still um, in Berlin, there's the school called uh, Fenritz. And um, I remember that some of the students came to me because I was already like training MMA and somebody was like, hey, there's this Brazilian black belt. He's uh, coming to Berlin and we should invite him to this gym to become our professor. And I'm like, well, that would be awesome to train with the BJJ black belt because um, until that time, I was never training with a black belt before and I haven't probably never seen anyone with a kimono till that time because I was just doing nogi and, you know, my MMA boxing stuff. And um, 
that didn't happen back in the days. So I was like, because our team was so small, I was like, okay, I want to go to Spitfire Gym because I heard that they were having negotiations with you about being the new, uh, no, at that time still Ulf Elert was their BJJ coach. So I was like, okay, I heard good things about him. I want to go to Spitfire. So I went to Spitfire and I was like, hey, is Ulf Elert still the coach here? And they were like, no, he's not the coach here no more. But next week, somebody else is going to come. And I was like, I wonder if that's Gabriel. That would be crazy. <laughs> and a week later, I just joined one, I think one of your first classes and um, never look back. Still love your training. Um, still attend to like the past six months was a little different, but uh, attend to most of your classes. Mostly Nogi though, because I'm one of those people that got promoted to blue belt and then <laughs> never put on the <laughs> gi anymore. <laughs> But um, enough of me, um, you were obviously talking about your childhood and um, how your jiu-jitsu journey started with already six years old, which is pretty early. And um, what I'm asking myself is obviously over here when we talk about um, Brazilian childhood, that could be a little rough, right? Especially like, I mean, today probably still, but back in the days probably even more. Did your mom try to find something for you to prevent you from going a different and dangerous path? No, it wasn't, wasn't the first intention. Uh, my mom is an educator. She's, she was a teacher, was a principal at a uh, kindergarten school. So her main intention is to help uh, bring to a sport to help the education. Of course, this will be involved in the process, uh, considering the surrounding in, in growing up in Rio, uh, we never had many issues like being sacrificed. We had like a uh, okay life; nothing was missing on us, but never had any kind of like luxury. One thing, for example, I appreciate like nowadays that I can provide myself and my family. Uh, one of the the main things like about food, because I remember I'm the oldest child with, amongst four. And we were six all together, my parents and my, my siblings. And going for supermarket, you have to count every exactly, you know. Having any extra yogurt could be something, oh, you got yogurt, you got a like, good mouth today, you know. Or like a special drink or something that wouldn't be uh, often. And and I know how my parents would make an effort or going to a restaurant and order something extra like a dessert. I will always concern the fact that uh, my my father, my my father, beside his daily work, he used to work on the weekends as a security uh, in a club to make extra money to provide like for ch for children. Eh? Uh, but we we, we live in a in a good house in an okay neighborhood and wasn't wasn't close to favela to the slums or anything. But of course, everything is connected. You no, know? the violence and the the things around because the social uh, distance is actually close and far at the same time, mm -hmm. far in terms of uh, economy wise, but close in terms of geography, you know. Uh, so we, we learn how to, to deal with this scenario in an early age. And today I'm th thankful, grateful to pass through this experience because uh, it helps me to understand the world better. So coming to Berlin, for example, which is a multi city, city, uh, we have lots of people from all over the world or some people like refugees or people with different social background and being a leader, being a coach, jiu-jitsu coach, dealing with these people, have this experience back in Rio, helped me to open my mind out and also to understand the people better, I would say. But yeah, fortunate, and we never had this kind of like suffering time, but I, I had the experience to uh, learn from, from people and also give back. My parents always in, encourage us to do like social or like voluntary uh, activities for charity. I used to do, when I, I saw myself, I want to be a teacher because I study I, I sports, science back in Brazil to become a teacher. I never thought that jiu-jitsu would be my full-time job, uh, especially back in, I started in the 90s. Uh, and jiu-jitsu wasn't expected to be like, you can live out of jiu-jitsu. Mm. This only came to my mind when I moved to Europe. Uh, so my goal was actually to be a school teacher and eventually a professor at university. That was my main goal through sports. So I used to do like some social project activities in the like kindergarten for 
like for community with small kids. We used to go to like old elderly places for like to do some sports with elderly people or uh, people with special need, you know, through sports. Because at the same time, I was using my skills, like knowledge skills, but I'm learning, but at the same time, developing like social skills and uh, help, help people. And Jiu-Jitsu is all about this, you know, always give back. So whatever Jiu-Jitsu I got from Jiu-Jitsu, I give back. That becomes also a mission for me. Is that something that you've got taught from the first day you stepped on the mat? Because, um, I mean, I was talking about like, you know, rough Brazil, Rio de Janeiro. That's, I'll, I'll tell a funny story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, as I said, no, I started teaching, I started uh, training with my first coach, Laete, in his house. And then a few years later, he moved to another place where it's on top of uh, like a pharmacy, an apotheke. And downstairs used to have some teenagers, some the kids from the street. They used to look after the cars, you know, to get some extra money. But they were on drugs. They were always fighting each other. And I used to live walking distance from the gym. So I used to go with my gi trousers and, and the jacket packed under, with the belt, my yellow belt. I was still yellow belt under my arm. And I always thought, man, these kids, you know, some of them are around my age. I was 10, 11, probably. I was always picturing my mind, what if they what if they want to challenge me? Say, ah, you're a fighter, let's do something, and I'm going to fight. So often on the way, I was in my mind preparing myself for something. And I was always like, this, okay, if they do something, I'm going to throw the jack on their chest to distract them, and then I'm going to shoot the bow leg. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it never happened. But one day, I, we arrived, and they will fight each other. And my first coach was at the same time there. He said, oh, you go upstairs. So we walk up the stairs and we were walk, walking, from, uh, looking from the window and and he had to control the situation. So he took him down and controlled and, and I said, ah, you stay away from this kid. Uh, but a direct situation never happened. But the surround was always something where like they sent to some shot and they have to hide you because it could be close to you right. and stuff like this. What I mean, um, jiu-jitsu is, for my experience, um, a sport that attracts all sorts of people, right? And um, especially in a time where jiu-jitsu was still like a sport where you couldn't make a living from it, you know? But until now, it's a probably multi-million dollar or euro industry. But back in the days, it was still like a really, I don't know if it's the English uh, right word, niche sport, you know, yeah, like, yeah, uh, that's you know, like judo was really big. And they're elite, actually. It's very elite sport, it's expensive. Uh, there are two lineage in jiu-jitsu, right? The father lineage and the grace lineage. I came from a father lineage. Father, uh, he was teaching jiu-jitsu to, get, to give it for the community. And and that, that actually influenced my my lineage. Laet Basel, my first coach, was also from the same lineage. And he was always always about like socialize and uh, give back, give like scholarships, training for free, you know. I, I, don't, have, I don't have money to, to, to pay for the membership. But your talent, okay, you're gonna come, you're tough, and then try to make something out of jiu-jitsu. Like you said, get off the street into jiu-jitsu. Same thing with Julio, the same lineage. And on the other side, have the Gracie lineage, uh, which is on the nice area of Rio, the Porsche area, and in, in teaching the, the like celebrities or like politicians and stuff. And then and they, they give the visibility of jiu-jitsu and they're doing challenges and they, Uh, break down the other gyms or the, uh, challenge the other martial arts to make a name of jiu-jitsu, which actually works well with a good marketing, you know. And doing this, they went all the way to the UFC. They created the UFC, yeah. right, with this with, uh, concept. Um, my, my question was actually was going into the direction of um, the gym where you attended to was obviously was a big mix of different people coming from different areas. Obviously, also like you just said, people that, couldn't afford training because obviously it was like a new information to me that jiu-jitsu was an elite sport yeah. which not many people could afford back in the days i didn't even know about those two lines you know i had my first gi now we have two type of gis there's like a pure like thin gi which was the one i was wearing for a long time and the other one is like this a thicker uh it was super expensive i i was only able to buy this gi or to get from the sponsor when i was a teenager or something or even older Yeah, probably the teenager. Uh, the mats were different. The mats was, 
how can I say, like a carpet with something so it's very dusty, like a lot of dust come off the mat. Mm. And those first like puzzle mat, like synthetic material came later on. Uh, I remember they used to adapt the mat area with, you know, the tires. Yeah. Like from the car. You get like a little piece of the tires, a lot of them like the, the uh, left over from the mechanic and you get the tires, you get a machine, break them down and you put like a lane, like a carpet, yeah. the tires and some old mat and then put a cover, a cover from like, you know, like a, like a truck cover. Not to cover like the a plastic sheets. Yeah, exactly. And that was on top and that was a mat. <sighs> <laughs> that was how it used to be our mat <laughs> after this old school mat. <laughs> good, good time, good memories. And the thing is, like, you've obviously been, you know, you're coming from a, I wouldn't say pretty, from a pretty decent household compared mm -hmm. to other people coming from Rio, but you've been training with people that came from bad areas, probably. Did you um, recognize at the time already that um, you could? Bonds with all kinds of all sorts yeah, of people. On the mat, you're all the same. That's the thing. That's the beauty about jiu-jitsu, and the respect. The church is, of course, those kids who say, "Okay, uh, you're not from the favela. They want to prove something." All of them. But once you give them hard time training, they respect you. And and the other way around. Okay, if they, for example, some higher social level kid who try to bully a kid who doesn't have much opportunity like financially or something but then thing goes gets even on the mat so always and that's a good lesson you learn to respect each other despite and when, when we go to the mat we respect the hierarchy uh but we have people like have doctors lawyers uh celebrity training together with people maybe not the same social area but they have to respect each other because they share the skills. Not you could be richer, you could live in a nice place, but on the mat we're all the same. Right. <laughs> when did you when did you start competing? My team, my my kids uh, team was always a competition team. So my first competition was actually half half year after such training. All right. I, I, st I have a video footage of it. For real? <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. You just send it to me. Maybe I, I can attach it to, to, the, to yeah, the podcast. I, I have to send it to you. I need to find it. Uh, I did the Ozotogari in Amba. <laughs> it wasn't a school. Then you can see this mat I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah, but we always compete. And my my first coach's son, he's now in the UFC, Raoni Barcelos. So he was... My, my light was always in competition, especially for his son. And he always encouraged us to compete, to be a good training partner for his son. He worked well, he's now in the UFC. And so the hardest train, hardest competition was actually in the gym because mm -hmm. we fight for life. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the son didn't want to lose uh, not close to his father and we didn't want to, okay. Uh, train hard, hard, fight uh, easy. Uh, yeah, I remember going for war and, for war and training and then crying afterwards and then laughing when the train is over. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it really connects, you know, this is what I've always felt with um, all sorts of martial arts, you know, but especially like with jiu-jitsu. Um, I just had the talk with uh, Robert Nestor, we were just have, having the, the chat about, you know, another black belt here in Berlin, yeah. about um, us going on the mat and we are friendly to each other, but we're giving each other hell from time to time on the mats, you know? Sometimes we just, you know, flow roll, try mm -hmm. to drill some techniques and stuff, you know? But at the end of the day, if we roll, you know, try to injure each other, but we not try to make it easy, easy for each other so that you can, you know, you get more resistance and you learn actually, because that's what we always say. If the, if the training is super hard, you know, and your training partners don't give you any space, then the competition is gonna be more easy obviously, yeah. you know? Yeah, and you follow the unwritten rules, you know? We can train hard, we can give each other a hard time, we can be aggressive, but still be respectful. Of course, you have to consider the levels. If, if we are at a similar level, uh, we're gonna push each other to improve. And the sign is like, the unwritten rules is the way 
we treat each other, the way we shake each other's hand, the way if you interrupt around depends on the circumstance if somebody next or the wall or something. If we accidentally bump to each other in a situation uh, unintentionally, you say sorry, you know, we earn respect. And that gives like a, a green light. Yeah, go for it, you know. And I can be aggressive. You're going to be aggressive back to me. The way we react against each other in a, let's say, if I'm able to achieve the position, how, or like if I dominate, if I tap my partner, or if I get tapped, if I get dominate, uh, it says a lot how I'm going to react. It says a lot about respect and give a go. For some people you train, you don't have the same vibe, the same vibe, and you feel like, ah, if I want to go hard, this person is going to be uh, uncomfortable feeling. Mm-hmm because of certain reaction. So you feel like you block yourself, but some other people, ah, cool, man, this this guy, right. he goes hard, they go hard, it's all cool. And then gives like open green light, ah, that's cool, now we push each other. Then you go, man, that's, well, that's very cool, thank you. And then yeah. we thank each other, right? So you get this vibe and then you, the more you train, the more experience you have, the more time on the mat, the more people you know, the easy is gonna be to to identify this kind of uh, behavior attitude. At the end of at the end of the day, we 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 learn to deal with our own ego. And me as a competitor, as a coach, as a leader, I lead with ego all the time, on and off the mat. And in order to be able to lead to deal with people's ego, I need to lead uh, deal with my own ego. Uh, and it, for example, I'll give an example. I'm your jiu-jitsu coach, right? But uh, as long as we are having a rolling round, five, six, ten minutes, during this time, I'm not your coach, I'm your training partner because we have enough experience, so we train together. I'm not going to be your coach during this time. I'm not going to stop the round to give instructions. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to uh, tell you what to do during the round. We're just going to enjoy the whole round. After the round, if you ask me for some feedback, I'll do it. I'm going to be your coach when you roll with somebody else. I'm from outside. Right. Because then the, 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 the reason why I do this, first of all, because I want to train, I train that moment, and I see you're going to be a good training partner for me, and I want to give you the feeling that you are during this time. I'm going to, I'm, of course, I'm your coach, but I'm also that moment I'm training, your training partner. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to hesitate to train. Oh, Maybe Gabriel, uh, if you uh, inappropriate, if I go hard on him, I should resp- No, not, I don't want to give you this feeling. And I also don't want to give this feeling like, ah, if I do something good, it's because I'm letting you do it. Oh, I need to always give feedback to you. That's how I deal with my ego. And But when you train somebody else, I'm watching from outside, so I have different perspective. So I give instruction, which is different. Does that make sense? Hundred percent. Yeah, that's the way I, I deal with the situation, and I feel more comfortable to uh, lead with, with deal with everybody else ego, so 100%. I can tell the person directly. You know, safe. Um, what is also like a big factor of jujitsu? I mean, you can always compare it to other martial arts as well, but I think, especially in jujitsu, because of the tap, tap yeah. yeah, losing is a big thing that you have to come clear with in jiu-jitsu because obviously if you go on the mat, you're gonna tap. Um, even as a black belt, you know, like we know and we know a lot of black belts and even yourself from time to time, if somebody of your old teammates comes, you know, you probably not as much anymore as a white belt or blue belt, but there's certain situations where you have to tap, so, so speak, losing. How important do you think is that or was that in your upcoming for your jiu-jitsu career? So in training, of course, you have different type of training. Uh, you, people train jiu-jitsu for self-defense, for fitness and quality of life, or for preparation for competition. So I follow different phase of training for myself. Sometimes I wanna train, uh, just because I wanna enjoy training, I'm not thinking about competition, so it's a different vibe. Uh, when, and sometimes training for, to prepare for competition. So the the way I prepare is different. The way I'm going to roll is different. Talking about tapping and the ego thing, how to deal with it. Uh, you you think we think about tapping as giving up. So we're giving up, and then you tell me I'm weak. 
but tapping is also telling you like well done like when if you got a position i'm tapping training for like well done as like i'm giving you a, a, a sign that you did you did a good job i'm not giving up i'm not t- uh, weak and i just couldn't stop it you know it's the mindset thing so mm-hmm. I could give you a well done, or it could be, oh man, I, I uh, I'm losing. No, it's not. There's no losing. It's like learning, improving, right? Uh, so if I have this mindset, I'm not gonna tell myself I'm a loser. I'm telling you that you're a winner. It's right. different, right? It's a different mindset. Well, that's something that you need to learn, I guess. You know, because I still like have been doing the sport for many years now, and still I have people that do the sport longer than me or the same amount of time as me. And as we just previously talked about, when we start rolling, the way I shake your hand or you shake my hand or the you way how, the vibe, yeah. how yeah, you, you sometimes, you sometimes feel, feel the vibe, you know, and even, even myself, like I have to be self-conscious about it. Sometimes I have a bad day because some fucked up shit happened to me and I go home, come on the mat and I just told this in the, in the previous podcast, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm so angry. I'm going to get my, I gonna get my taps today. Let you know? somebody else. <laughs> and most of the time I felt like whenever I got emotional on the map, I got manhandled by other people, you know, because every person that, you know, started rolling egoless with me, they had a calmer mind than me. And when they had a calmer mind, they could work better. And that's the same with fighting in a competition, for example. You know, people be sometimes like, Oh, this is so stressful and stuff. Yeah, but the calmer you can be in in yourself or about yourself the easier it's all about self-control uh we we step on the mat in a daily base and we have our goals right but the goals not necessarily meets our needs sometimes you go to a training your goal might be uh to do minimum six rounds to hit at least like three you got passing or to do a takedown or do a submission, that you tell yourself that's your goal. But in fact, you have different needs. Like you, as you just said, you had a bad day, or you're frustrated with something, or something didn't go well as you planned on that day. Could be personal, could be professional, could be something with family. And you need in training to let it out so uh, you go back home different. Uh, I do, uh, people train with me as like hobby, right? But people's hobby is my job. So my perspective is different. Uh, I, the risk of this happening is like change the mood, the, the atmosphere of the environment. And there's a higher risk of injuries. So I need to control, I need to identify this changing. If I see you acting differently, if I see you picking different partners, if I see you... Uh, change your way of training. I might, I might come to you and say, take a round break, or now you do with this round. I roll with you because mm-hmm. then I, I can control you. I'm not saying you, I'm saying you gen- in general. Mm-hmm. So it's my task, it's my role to identify this, uh, to avoid certain things happening. Uh, it's a, t- it's a thing, it's a sensitive thing. And if you ask me how you learned this, I don't know. <laughs> it's, by, it's a feeling, you know. It's a feeling, you learn by doing, yeah. you know. It's just, I was fortunate to spend time, a long time with different mental, different like training park competitors. And I, we, I guess it just, we learn from each other. We go through different experience. And it's just that, so I can, I had the, the feeling just come, you know. It's like a, being more sensitive, uh, observing people, observing their body language. It changed some mood like the mood on that day is different right and the the time on the mat says a lot what is this compared to your attitude when you go on a tournament going a tournament uh i have to tell myself what what's what i'm the reason i'm going to tournament what am i doing for and who am i doing for uh at the end of the day, I have to do for myself. So it's all about challenging myself. Of course, there are a lot of people involved, a lot of great, great expectations of other people, but I have to do for myself. And I try not to change much, actually, in competition. 
uh, obviously, when I was younger, I was going there more because of my friends than for myself because we're all going together. And but then, when I moved to Europe, my, my friends was in Brazil, so I had to create a new connection, new uh, social life here. And at the beginning, I was co- going to compete by myself. So the 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 order, the process was like this. So that, as I said earlier, I came to, I first came to London, and when I told myself when I decided, okay, Jiu-Jitsu is going to be my full time job, uh, how I'm going to make this career possible. I need to get more visibility. So I was looking for training for myself to compete. Once I compete and I succeed, I get uh, more visibility and then people come train with me. And then a student of mine is going to compete. If you succeed, then you have a team and then you grow. That's how we, we grow and we're still growing. That's a process. And I need to learn. Okay, I was used to compete in Brazil with all my te- teammates, my trainer. Now I'm here by myself. That made me grow a lot. Mm. To be more independent, more like uh, self, like independent, basically, and it opened, it changed my mindset in jujitsu. I actually improved a lot. I got mature, personal and professional, and made me a better coach uh, and a better person to provide this for the others. How did you cope with doubts if you had any? To try to find a purpose, so I tell I, I tell myself wh- what am I doing? Why why am I, am I doing this? Uh, find the motivation, uh, and go back to time. No, when go back to the root, mm. and find a mission. I think all have a mission. Um, I I have a, my main motivation every time I go. So I, I do the same thing every day, working like over 30 hours a week teaching jiu-jitsu. That's my office, a full-time job. But if I don't have a purpose, uh, I get to a comfort comfortable zone, comfort zone, and I would lose motivation. Imagine doing the same thing over and over every day. So I always find something that gives me motivation. Uh I like to teach from the kids, kids uh, to the elderlies, from white belt to black belt, from a non-competitor to competitor. So they all have different reasons why they're training with me, different needs and different goals. So I look for ways to f- fulfill these needs and goals through jiu-jitsu, which are all different. There are a lot of m- uh, meanings behind mm. and different motivations, you know? Teaching kids, teaching uh, teenagers, Teach adults, competitors, no competitors. See them growing on, on, on and off the mat, uh, learning their skills, growing as a person. You know what makes me happier? Uh, it's not when somebody get graduated for another belt or get a good title. It makes me happier when somebody comes, oh, coach, I just got, a, uh, got married or have a child or I got promoted to a job and they shared that with me. Oh, I just moved, I just got a car, uh, just bought a house. There's nothing to do directly with jiu-jitsu, but it makes me happy, you know? Because mm. somehow, jiu-jitsu helps. The lesson we learn in jiu-jitsu, or in martial arts in general, being resilient, uh, focus, follow the process, be patient. Uh, we learn how to fall, to go back up, right? How to be underneath in an un- uncomfortable situation to sweep over, come back on top, right? Being in a chokehold position, I have to breathe. If we can make a comparison in life all the time. Life is not a rocket, it's always a roller coaster. Sometimes we're mm. up, sometimes we're down. But as long as you go forward, we're in a good way. Yeah. Just know you need to know you need to know the direction. Right. You need a target, you know. Sometimes you have to go take some shortcut, sometimes a long, long, uh, long way. But knowing that where you're going. That that's the key, and and that that that's motivation for me. I mean, just uh, previously you said that until you came to Europe, you haven't really thought or believed that jujitsu is gonna be your path of way of your income and how that you're gonna be a yeah. teacher. So, what made you do make this decision to 
leave Brazil in the first place? And what was the point where you thought like, hey, I could make a living from my sport? Now, first, uh, not that I, I underestimate the, the power of jiu-jitsu. It's just because I didn't have many uh, good examples and motivation. I remember in 2004, 2004, when the, the World Championship used to take place in Rio only. And and there is a legend, legendary fight between Ronaldo Jacare and Roger Gracie. Yeah. Black belt open class finals. Roger Gracie broke Jacare's arm in an amba. He didn't tap. He fought all the way to the end with a broken arm and he won. So the biggest title yeah, his career. He came from Manaus up north and came to Rio and competed in Rio on this. It's his big, biggest title. Jack Arek couldn't afford, I heard that, that he couldn't afford to, to fly back to his hometown. So he was the, on top of the, the ice back, winning the most important, and it was just a matter of time. And I remember thinking, man, if those guys on that level, it's very hard to imagine. Then I pursued my studying career. Okay, what is the closest one to Jiu-Jitsu? Sport. So I studied sport. Mm-hmm. Of course, Jiu-Jitsu was always there. I used to teach. I, I work in a school as a, a after-school program teaching Judo. I'm also Judo Black Belt. And so teaching Judo or Jiu-Jitsu in an after-school program. Uh, as a school teacher during the day, and I was teaching twice or three times a week in a gym, like in my beginning of career teaching Jiu-Jitsu. So Jiu-Jitsu would be always there as a parallel, like part-time job. So my my future plan when I was in Brazil, thought, okay, I'm gonna have this fixed uh, job here, stable, and Jiu Jitsu gonna be like, a, like to just to add something. And when I moved to London, I saw a different scenario. Now, I was very lucky actually that I ended up in a place where Jiu Jitsu was growing fast in Europe. Thing was getting more stable. Uh, just mentioned Roger Grace, he was living in London. So a lot of uh, professional guys, they chose London, UK, to to be their home base. Roger, one of the, the, the greats of all time, he was there. Uh, the Steamer brothers, Braulo and Victor Steamer, they were there too. Why do you think was that? Why London? I think one brought one person brought the other. You know? oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I know Roger because Roger's father was in London. He was a pioneer of jiu-jitsu in, in UK. So Roger came to train uh, with his father. And I guess just the connection, one brings the other. And the reason why I moved to London is because I met the mother of my kids in Brazil. She was there on holidays and she was living in London. So I, looked, I, went, I went to London to, to be with her. Uh, and then we had a relationship. We got married, we had children. Uh, they are all here in Berlin. We're not together as a couple anymore, but we are still family. We're the parents of our kids. Oh, uh, but that, that was the reason. There's nothing to do with jiu-jitsu. Mm. Uh, and then once I decided, okay, after four months, I think it was going well. All the opportunity came up to me was through jiu-jitsu. And then I told myself, okay, and I'm going to do as, mu- as much as I can to make jiu-jitsu a living. And it's been working. Not just as a competitor. I was always falling the way as a competitor, as a coach, as a like, referee or event organizer, or doing a like, competition, organized competition. Uh, was it a gut ref- feeling or was it just the pure love to the sport where you were like, hey, I just wanna- Yeah, the main reason is love of the sport and and I'm always preparing myself. And like, it's a con- constant process of learning and uh, improving. No, I not got to a point. No, I never got to a point that okay, I know everything. I'm comfortable. I'm always learning. I'm traveling a lot. I train with different people. I learn from them. I teach and learn. Exchanging. Uh, I always go back to Brazil. I, I, I always want to be a student. And, and once a year, I need to be in a situation. That I'm a student to learn, and and that's an endless process. Refereeing. I learn a lot in refereeing as well. Watching the matches. Watching other other matches. Uh, coaching, you, know, you see the other competitors. Uh, it's a forever process, mm. you know. There's this um, quote or this thing where people always say, "You start your jiu-jitsu career, or you start your jiu-jitsu journey. Yeah, you become a white belt with a couple stripes, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, 
black belt. And um, I feel like sometimes there's a lot of tension on the mats when it comes to graduation, especially when, for example, you start with somebody at the same time, and you're like, why am I still a blue belt? Why is he getting promoted to, bl to purple belt and all that kind of stuff? And I feel like we had those situations over here in Germany or in Berlin a couple of times as well. And I've experienced that with, that with you too. But I always felt that you were very keen to tell the people, hey, it's not about the color of your um, belt. It's about the um, improvements you make for yourself. So you can't, you can't compare it to other people. Yeah. What would you say about that, especially like graduation as a process in itself, and also still being a student, even though now you're a black belt? Yeah, so first of all, uh, is that the, the journey is individual, it's an individual journey. And all of us, we shouldn't compare ourselves with the others. We can always take the others as a, inspiration, motivation, but not to be like them, but but to follow up the steps and make a version, a better version of ourselves. And the only person you can compare, it's yourself. How you were before, how you know today, how, what you, how you're gonna be uh, tomorrow. And, and so I'm try to be clear with that principle to be fair to everyone, to understand that everybody follows the same principle. I like to do a group graduation, and one of the things I love the most is when somebody gets promoted and, and it's a group achievement. Everybody cheer for that person and say, hey man, you deserve. So you're part of the achievement. And because it is, Jiu-Jitsu is an individual sport that relies a lot on the teamwork. Without training partner, you cannot improve. So we need each other. And and talking about learning process, how I learn, I learn from my students too. There'll be things that I teach you that eventually you might be able to do better than me and have a different adjustment. So I want to learn from you. Mm -hmm. There are things that my students do better than me and I want to learn from them. And because Jiu-Jitsu is very individual in terms of uh, body type, uh, abilities and skills, things that I do on you is going to be different than I do somebody against somebody else because of different abilities and stuff. And there are probably some things that you do better than me that it might give you a diff different uh, input, different detail, adjustment of, uh, that open up my mind. Oh, cool, that's good. I remember once I was refereeing a, a white belt match and I saw a chokehold that I've never seen before. I learned from a white belt. That was the first time I saw it. And that's one of the things in Jiu-Jitsu that's different from other martial arts. And there's always something new. The sport's always evolving. Uh, it's not like a curriculum that, okay, you learn these techniques up to this belt and next up. There's always something new. It's endless. And and if I don't, if I stop training, I'm not going to improve. I think that's what keeps me a forever student too, you know. Yeah, right. And I think you need to, at that part of time, you need to put your ego 100%. to the side, you know, 100%. because, I mean, I've been rolling... A lot over the years, you know, you know, the guys we have on the mats, you know, like we have a lot of s strong people. Um, some of them I've started with are black belts now and I'm really happy for them. And um, sometimes there was the time where I just tapped somebody with a submission I learned in London from another coach, you know. And 99% of the time, those people were looking at me and were like, yo, can you show me that submission, how you did that? That was great. That was crazy, you know? And compared to boxing, kickboxing, and MMA, if somebody is hitting a spinning elbow or a spinning heel kick, you're not asking him like, hey, can you show me how you did that spinning heel kick? You're just like, yeah, okay, you just got me with that fucking Can you shot, knock me you know? down again? Yeah, can you, can, you, can you please knock me down again and show me how you did that, you know? So... It's a, it's an endless improvement and you can always learn from people. And that's what I've also felt from people that are, I wouldn't necessarily say as skilled as you, but not as long as you in the sport, you know, like people always say, or even you said on the mats, like, hey, you can learn a lot of, a lot of stuff from blue belts or yeah. even from white belts, you know, not even a submission, but just, you know, white belts are most of the time a little more aggressive 
than all the other belts because they don't know what they're doing. They're just mm -hmm. trying to survive, you know? But if you roll with them, you're gonna see like, okay, this is a little bit more closer to a competition actually than rolling with a bl uh, with a br uh, yeah, brown less, belt. Less just, control, yeah. Right. So um, we previous been talking about um, teaching, right? And teaching was always like the big thing for you and you made a living out of this. And what you've told me when we, when we got here was that teaching children is like, this is what makes your heart pumping. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously you told me already, but I would like to know again, like why is it that you love teaching children so much and what is it what you can take from yeah. children? As I said, uh, uh, my mom was always in school as a school teacher, especially for kindergarten and preschool. So I grew up uh, around kids. And my mom always said I always had something special with kids uh, in my, my childhood. And when I moved out of my, I was teach, always, always teaching kids and back in Brazil too. But when I start teaching in a foreign language, not from my, my uh, mother tongue, first in English and then German, I always felt more comfortable teaching the kids. And I realized up to a certain age, maybe seven, eight years old, when the personality is still in the building process. All the kids are the same, despite the culture, despite the language, despite, despite the, the surround. They have the similar behavior, the similar feelings. And, and it was, was easier for me to identify this because I was realized, oh, this kind of behavior is pretty much the same back in Brazil and England and then oh, Germany. They're all the same. Their reaction is the same. Is a pew of the kids, and you see the influence of the culture and the society you are you are in. Maybe from that age, that uh, you open my, open up more your mind. And I could also uh, the language barrier wasn't a problem then, and it, and I actually felt more comfortable teaching the kids because I could try more English and then German uh, with. Because they never would judge me. Oh, he's speaking wrong. Or, yeah, they didn't care. They didn't care, and it was actually helping me out. <laughs> was a deal. Was a uh, a fair deal. You know? Okay, I teach you jujitsu. You teach me German or English, yeah. <laughs> and we we find in the, we, we meet in the in the middle. And yeah, and I love I love you know just because they are. If the kids they like you, they're gonna show. If they don't like you, they're gonna show too. Yeah, and and. And it's always very true and very transparent and you can learn a lot. And all the feelings, you know, I think the main thing about this podcast is like mental health and everything. And we tempt, as we grow, we tempt to hide our feelings, yeah? to pretend, uh, to show that we're tough, you're strong. And the kids, they don't do this. Just show, right? If they're happy, they're going to show they're happy. If they're sad, they're going to show they're sad. If they're angry, they're going to show they're angry. And and we adults, especially as a coach, I need to deal with this scenario straight away uh, and teach them skills at the same time because jujitsu gives you a power. It's like as a weapon, you know. That's why there's a lot of responsibility. A lot of schools they tend to put a, a lower belt to leads the kids class and i believe the opposite i think the the most experienced person the most uh the, the highest belt if they like kids of course and you need to like kids first of all mm. <laughs> they should have the responsibility to teach kids because i think it's more responsible to teach kids than the adults because you're you're forming character you're building character and giving them values and it has if they start the earlier they start the better it is if they understand these values early on be way easier in the future. Mm. Understand respect, mutual respect, discipline, uh, focus, and everything that all this cliche from martial arts, you need to live in a daily basis. Yeah. Not, not just act. Why would you, I mean, I know that you are very keen about teaching your own daughters Jiu Jitsu as well. You know, um, I've been seeing them on the mats from early age on. And uh, they were to be, be doing uh, pretty well as well, and having fun with the sport, which is also like not always promised that you do a sport. And you know, like those football dads that be like, "Oh, I want my son to be a football player," and your son is just like, "No, I just want to be 
playing guitar like I don't want to play anything you know but some people you know if, especially you've been lucky that your your kids love the sport of jiu jitsu as well why would you recommend kids or other parents to send their kids to jiu jitsu training first of all first of all about, about my own kids uh jiu jitsu is just one of the activities they do i never force them never push them to do jiu jitsu make out, out of living as i did it's different purpose they do uh once they are training for me during their regular class they are not my kids they are one of the students i so i treat them as a student they understand this but i also uh encourage them to do other activities so they are involved with arts and culture they swimming uh or basketball now they're doing gymnastic uh yeah like painting or oh, music music they play piano and stuff i think this is important to so i see for my kids they're still young eight years old shouldn't take seriously because if they don't want to it's for fun it has to be fun and help to develop that physically and mental skills and especially social socially and that's my main goal as a teacher and, and the father and and answering the other question i think teaching uh, i had the privilege to start early so when i teach kids i also remind myself when i was a kid learning jiu jitsu a lot of things i do as a coach i used to do as a student in the same age and i say exactly the same thing after 30 years the same thing that my my friends back in the used to do i see the kids now they're doing the same thing it just proved that the natural doesn't change mm -hmm. the nature doesn't change and if you learn if you uh, if you're able to sort situation that happens on the mat you're going to be able to deal with the same situation out, outside of the mat in terms of uh people relationship uh the way we we act our attitude on the mat the way we roll the way we treat each other says a lot about our personality so overcome the the challenge in an early age especially nowadays where some people have this mindset of uh don't push too much you know always uh you shouldn't tell the kid that you because you have to understand that you lose you know you're not good in everything you're not perfect you need to accept like we we learn our limits as well we try to uh improve our potential as well as understanding our limits try to overcome up to a certain point and and when okay as a kid i'm good i can beat this kid but the other kid's gonna beat me so it keeps me humble you know and there's always as we grow in your surrounding social surrounding it's all about like self-affirmation you need to prove something to be accepted you know uh it depends how you look like physically uh how you behave and you need to give this power of like self esteem self confident no matter how i look no matter who i am no matter no matter my my social background i i have a skill and i i'm confident because i i know something and it's like it's better knowing something without needing than needing without knowing you know right and like the other day a kid came to me said coach i'm not going to do sparring because i hurt my hand and the head's hand was swollen so like, what happened ah, i just hit another kid in the playground why did you do that ah he just called me some bad stuff and i just hit, beat him up so listen uh, in terms of self defense self confidence and that's the that's the the borderline you know i don't need always to use my skills to defend myself to prove a point and then nobody's going to mess with me is the attitude that says it all if somebody comes to you and says something just you know it's like it's like a venom you know to get bully on offending certain things it's like if you put something here that's going to if i drink it's going to make me feel sick i'm not going to drink right i just leave it mm uh and that's self defense that's what jiu jitsu teach me now i'm not going to be around some people in a place that makes me feel uncomfortable or there's a risk of 
they need to do something, I just move. I just leave the place. Mm. And when you're a kid, this happens all the time, right? And and that's one of the biggest lessons for kids. So bring your kids to jujitsu, they're gonna learn among a lot of things, have a better understanding of themselves and create an, your identity. You have your own identity and make your more strong personality. I would say that that what happens to me. And it's also like a big and good bonding and connection point in every part of the world because everywhere you go, every city, every country you go to nowadays ha has at least one jiu-jitsu school. Doesn't matter if it's Gracie's or GF team or how those all those schools are called all over the world. But I think if you have a, or even if you don't have the skill of jiu-jitsu, if you go on a mat um, and try nogi, for example, as well, nogi and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I just try to put, you know, put it put it together. Um, you kind of always get into the mix of a community mm -hmm. where you can bond and connect with people. For example, you're new in a city. You know, I always say that, like, people be like, hey, I'm new in a city. I don't know how to bond and connect with people. I'm like, maybe you should, you know, do sports, but like cool sports, you know, like combat sports sometimes is a little bit like jiu-jitsu can be too, but combat sports is a little bit too um, competitive sometimes, you know, about like, I'm better than you and I want to show you whether it's in jiu-jitsu. Okay, you can have like two, three of those kind of people on the map or maybe all of those, but then it's maybe not the school for you, but at least a bunch of people gonna be on the same mindset as you. Maybe it's just, you know, work at home dads or mothers or children that, you know, just do this for fun and just wanna connect, do sports with you. Yeah, I think jiu Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu culture, the community is pretty cool. Everybody gets easy going with each other. And I would say, especially because of the Brazilian culture, because at every Jiu-Jitsu school, At some, at some point, there'll be there'll, there was some Brazilian involved in the in this lineage. Now maybe now nowadays it's different coach, but probably he learned from a Brazilian. Mm -hmm. So there's some Brazilian. There's a Brazilian uh, the Jiu-Jitsu lifestyle. There's a lot of Brazilian culture. The way you greet each other. Uh, the for example, if you're thinking about the traditional uh, judo, let's say ju Japanese. You now you bow. You know there's more like Japanese style of. Uh, At your attitude and jujitsu, you just uh, slap and bump. You do this, oh, you know, it's, there's a lot of Brazilian uh, culture involved, and and that influence everybody around. It's like you come to a place and you're like, I do jujitsu, cool, man. You see, you see your, your body leg is different. You see your ear, probably. You see your neck or your the finger if you do gi. You see the the things on your fingers because of the grips, and and it's like, oh man. Ah, you do MMA as well. Oh, cool. Ah, you, you, this move works well for MMA. Like you said, it's a good connection. And it's funny, every time you go to a place and they don't know you, don't know them, you start a good conversation, you start open up after the first roll. Because <laughs> then you, 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 you feel the vibe, you know? Yeah. You need to roll first. After you roll, ah, cool, man. You're like, yeah. And then you just open up your head. People will be looking at you <laughs> suspicious and be like, who's this guy want to go in my gym and want, wants to prove who he is? experienced that a lot you know going like or people come to our gym from other countries and you roll with them you, just you have to, and to roll first <laughs> some, sometimes you have a hard great round with them you know like you know flying all and over the mountain and stuff respect. and then afterwards it's like damn where are you coming from oh i'm from i don't know ireland whatever it's like crazy bro you're good yeah crazy let's roll together tomorrow again and Bam, you've got a friend you know and then you have a drink after <laughs> yeah maybe maybe that's the you know? competition as well that's also cool They yeah, fight each yeah. other and after you're gonna hang out together. Most of the time, like even even M MMA, like um, there's no big, there's no actually there's no big hate to your opponents because um, from from my extent, it's always a lot of respect. Obviously, like you, you you work with a lot of nervousness and maybe aggressiveness, but it's most mostly nervousness uh, before your fight. Maybe mm -hmm. you want to show off a little bit and be like, oh, the more aggressive guy, to mind. Yeah, yeah, to to intimidate your your opponent, but. Like 99 or 9 out of 10 times, it's when when you finish the fight, you give each other the hand. Be like, hey, respect, thank you for this match. Like you say thank you, actually, you know, mm -hmm. like thank you for 
you yeah. know, kneeing my face and stuff. But most of the time, like after the fight, I meet my opponents in the hotel lobby because obviously we're in the same hotel. And then we meet each other and be like, hey bro, that was, that was a great night last night. Like, hey, let's have a drink. Let's, you know, exchange contacts. And That's like cool. with most of my opponents, I'm still in contact nowadays and like, you know, don't see each other that much, you know, but it's sometimes- It's a sport, at the end of the day, it's a sport. Yeah, right, right. Gabriel, thank you, thank you, thank you very much that you had the time to come here. Um, I know that last weekend you, um, I don't know, what was it for the, for the- Yeah, I was in, I was at the World Masters yeah. last week. Yeah, and uh, everybody was like, "Hey, if when Gabriel is, uh, is is getting gold, then you have to upload the podcast like right on uh, the spot on yeah. the next day and stuff, you know." And I was, I was, I was watching. Like, I remember that um, our guys from the gym they were meeting each other like at midnight in the gym <laughs> to to watch your fights, and I was at home on my phone just waiting for everybody posting your videos and stuff, and just like Emil even said, like I was so damn proud to 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 see you compete again um, because. You're not only a coach, like I said in the beginning of our talk, you're a role model as it as it's written in a book, basically, you know, and you even still compete, you know. You're not that old, you're not that broken down. Yeah, so you can you can you can, you can you can still <laughs> you can still take us on and even though I'm like 30 kilos heavier than you, you know, I have like really, really tough rounds. Like sometimes you don't always have to roll with me because obviously the weight is, is a big a big, big oh, factor funny. anyways, you know. But um, for me, it was really important to uh, have you in that talk because um, for me, this sport is like my heart goes into the sport. And I always say like, I probably like the Jiu Jitsu com community more than I like the MMA community, just competitive wise. Um, I think it's just a little bit more harmony in the Jiu Jitsu community. And um, As you just said, like sometimes you roll with people and you know, sometimes you be emotional, sometimes you, I don't know, something happens with your girlfriend, with your children, with your work, your salary, whatever problems you take on the mat, you know? And it's not just like we training together and going home, but it's like, yo, we have, we, we, we have a conversation together in training and after training and between rounds, you know? Like we'll be rolling, three hard rounds then in between i'm gonna sit on the mats and then we're gonna like hey gable like or hey julian how you doing how's life yeah man pretty tough right now and then you know you're giving advice is like i see people people come and talk to you for advice obviously you know and these people could be double your age and what i've also wanted to say is like where i was really proud of when i was on the mat when your dad's put on a gi for the first time where you were like you got very emotional because your your dad was training with you basically mm -hmm. and um that was you know it's just like family and it feels like family and that was really important for me to have you here and also to tell you this and um i always end my podcast with a with a question and um, my question to you today is um how much Just considering what I just said, how much does your team mean to you? And what does your team mean to you? It means a lot, you know. Uh, we came from a small neighborhood out of Rio with not much expectation on us, GF team. We have the same group from the beginning, same leaders. And we are spread in all the five continents. Uh, whenever I see my friends, I'm not a type of person who keeps in touch that much from long distance, even with my own family. But whenever we are in person, like right now, I really live the moment. And it's like, it, it seems like we've never been away from that long. And I'm always very proud to represent my, uh, the team and to have my friends represent the team. And not just as a successful competitors or coaches, but especially as a human being and to spread the legacy, to uh, plant the seed and to keep the same essence, uh, like treat people the same through jujitsu, make them pursue their lives, whatever they, they want professionally or, or in a private life. At the end of the day, make things light, you know, live lightly. And 
uh, have trust in people and, and look for like not just be healthy mentally but happy you know some people ask me how is it to live in Berlin Germany or when it's cold it's winter it's Berlin cool the, wherever you are at the place is going to be good not because of the place it's because of the people who are surrounded with you right and I I was just with some friends in the US and I got to see my old long like long term friends and see that their lives where they built up in the different place and like we probably we pretty much left uh, Brazil around the same time in like different continent but we we did the same thing and and I see for example that student treat me like their own own uh, friend or their own coach just because mm -hmm. of my friend you know it's like we're the same we, we're the same community no matter uh the distance good thing we have the technology nowadays the social media we can follow and then kind of know each other for a long yeah. time even though we don't keep in touch but we can kind of follow and i'm super happy I mean, the team means a lot to me you know i'm very proud and happy I had the privilege of having my my role models as my friends you know and as inspiration uh at gf team i'm not going to mention names because there are a lot of them yeah. <laughs> but I'll, I'll mention one name and first of all my parents that you just mentioned my parents i'm forever grateful and inspired for my parents to introduce me to jiu-jitsu and to encourage me forever even nowadays you mentioned about my father that he was training here he got back he was always into soccer uh when i was a kid uh, uh since i was competing a lot he was coming to watch and support in competition he did he took some lessons in jiu-jitsu for nearly one year just to understand the game so he was able to give him instructions together with the, co with the coach so to understand what's going on and after nearly 30 years a couple of months ago he's not able to play soccer anymore he started training jiu-jitsu awesome he's now he found it at school uh he's a white belt and uh, he's been doing like two two or three times a week he took a little break because of shoulder problem but he's like over 60 years old doing his first lesson in jiu-jitsu after 30 years just for lifestyle you know it makes me really proud uh so my parents first to mention and the other person uh just to represent the team is julio julio cesar is the gf team founder and he represents a lot of these things we're talking about, we're talking about he represents a lot you know i always ensure that i bring him minimum once a year here so you get to, to see him yeah uh oh he's always here because he represents this a lot you know and we are very privileged to have him as a leader and if you see me a leader carrying this legacy it comes from him as well and and one of the missions to pass this over so those come after me he just continue the same the same legacy and through jiu-jitsu everybody's going to take benefit in jiu-jitsu and outside of jiu-jitsu so thanks for having me i really enjoyed this chat uh thank you for watching and i wish all the success in the podcast in the appreciate upcoming it. upcoming guests appreciate it people you heard that man um <laughs> What a legend. Thank you very much for being here. Um, people give me, uh, please do me a favor, please follow Gabriel Reino on uh, Instagram. It's going to be linked down here. Also follow the GF team. There's probably going to be a GF team somewhere near in your city, you know, where you can just connect and just try it out if you always welcome yeah always welcome and uh, please subscribe to the channel now from now and sometimes i'm gonna have um special guests here where i'm gonna do uh english podcast okay so um yeah let some love here thank you very much appreciate it subscribe 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 and um was coach thank, thank you very you. much thank you guys Peace.